This is oral history tape number one with J.M. Brown, November the 3rd, 2010, interview with Connie Mason. There you go. Um, thanks, J.M., for coming out on such a beautiful day on Harker's Island. Probably the raindrops will be heard on the tape, so they'll know it's raining. But um, uh, first of all, uh, give me your uh, full name and, and uh, your birth date and uh, where, where you were born. My name is Julian Monroe Brown. <coughs> Pardon me, I got a little bit of a bug or something. Uh, 10, 13, 37, I was born, and I was born in Hatteras, North Carolina. In Cape Hatteras. Right. And uh, how long did you live up at Cape Hatteras? Well, until I started school, I think we moved back down here when I was about six years old. Now, you say back down here. T tell me your mom and daddy's name. <clears throat> My mother was, uh, her maiden name was Moji Austin. My father's name was Julian Brown, and my father was up there fishing in the wintertime at my mother. My mother had just come back. She was had been in Philadelphia to, <clears throat> in the Pierce Business School in Philadelphia, and uh, her uncle, my grandmother's brother, was superintendent of Sun Oil Shipyard. That's the reason she was up there. This was in 1930. Well... They met in 1935, but she went there in 33 and finished her school and, of course, came back to Hatteras. I don't know why, because I don't imagine the job market was too great for someone. But it was <laughs> but, home. But it was home, and maybe she, of course, it was during the heart of the Depression, and I imagine there weren't many jobs around. But how do, anyway. How do you spell Moji? M-O-G-I-E. M-O-G-I-E. That's a, her... <clears throat> My grandfather, my mother's father, mother was named Moji, and his or well, her father was Charles Oden, and Charles Oden washed a shore there off a Norwegian ship. So that was his mother's name back in Norway. M O G I E. That's a common name I find out talking to people all in in Germany, Norway, all down in the Low Countries in Europe. Wow. <clears throat> so, uh, so, and so, how did they end up in Cape Hatteras? He was waiting. His ship sunk on Diamond Shoals, and so he came ashore there. That was my grandmother, my great grandmother, Moji's father, Charles Oden. Okay. And that was the, all the Odens on Hatteras come Charles Oden. How about that? See, we, uh, I don't know, if, well, you probably had been to Hatteras. And, the uh, <clears throat> boys that own the red and white there, Dale, well, Dale's dead, but Alan Burris. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. You know, yeah. Alan, he's mm -hmm. cousin. Uh, well, everybody's cousin's an actress. If you go back far enough. But the Burris family, and of course, uh, they, my grandmother was, my grandmother, my, my mother's side, uh, were, were, her, her mother was a Burris, and, and her father was a Stowe. Well, on my, on my grandfather's side, his mother was an Odin, and his father was an Austin. So all these people came from one man. Thomas Austin was the original Austin from all the Austins from Kerala right on, well, we'll say the Hatteras, because the Oak Oak Austins all come Hatteras. Mm -hmm. And I, I was at, this summer, this past summer, uh, Alan gave me a disc of the Burris family, and John Burris, he washed the shore there in 1717, and all the Burrises came from him. And of course, all the Odins come from Charles Oden. And I don't know if I have to I haven't gone back far enough to find out about them, but I imagine they probably did the same thing. There was two sets of stoves. Uh, a friend of mine lives in Alabama as a stove. He did a lot of research. He <clears throat> Sorry about that. That's not for us. But, but he calls me every once in a while, wants to talk, and I listen because I don't know as much about stoves as I do. But there was, there was what they call Kenny Keats stoves or Rodanthe stoves. They moved to Atras. That was Mr. Irv Stowe and his crowd. And then my crowd of stoves was Caleb Stowe and 
They were already at Hatteras, where they come from. I don't know. Probably washed ashore there. <laughs> Most everybody on the Outer Banks were shipwrecked sailors, and they married. The Austins married right directly into the Indians. Oh, the Austins did. Right, oh. right directly into the Indians. Into the Hatteras? Hatteras Indians. Uh-huh. They were friendly Indians. You know? Oh, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. Very, very friendly. They had plenty of something to eat. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you find hostile Indians where they were hungry. Right. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, they, they didn't want competition for that's their right, foods. Exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Well, isn't, that, isn't that interesting that uh, that both your uh, the lines of your family come from shipwrecks? I think that's yeah, all of them came from shipwrecks. And my, on the Brown side of my family, they came high county, and they moved in there. They come out of Rhode Island. And they moved in there sometime in the 1600s, high county. Wow. And on my grandmother's. On my father's side, they were Shavenders in Beaufort County, but they weren't, they were Huguenots. Mm. They come in, I got, we had a reunion a couple of years back, and uh, cousins of mine did a lot of research to get ready for it, and they, they were in the second ship that came into Jamestown. Oh my stars. So, uh, but they were Chavonet, or they were French Huguenots. See, in France, uh, the French had a Huguenot king, Henry IV, and while he, during his reign, the Huguenots had walled their cities in. You know, they were—I guess they were segregated, just like most people were that weren't of you know like mind. They, that's right, like mind. They had to get off to themselves, keep them getting exterminated. So after he died, after Henry IV died, then you had uh, Louis. I believe it was the 16th came on, and under him there was a there was a Cardinal Richelieu you've heard of. Mm-hmm. Well, he made up him up an army and tore some walls down in these cities, and that's what scattered him Huguenots all over. See, Charleston was a Huguenot city. Newburn was was settled by Huguenots and Swiss, and then they just scattered them all. And Doctor Coors, you know, it used to be. A, well, he had a clinic there in Beaufort, but prior to that, he was he was a doctor at sea level, and his family were Huguenots. He, Do you know how to spell that? Do you know Huguenot or I mean Kurs? He lives to Otway, Doctor Kurs does. Now he he he's not still alive. Oh yeah, he is. Yeah, he just retired about two years ago. No kidding. Yeah, you don't talk to him. He's yeah, he's a. His crowd moved over in Alsace, who already know over next to Germany. Uh-huh. That's how they escaped getting their heads chopped off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. But see, when, when the Huguenots came to in the English into a Anglo environment, like in America, they Anglicized their names. And uh, this fellow Chabonet, uh, he... He, I guess he kept adding letters to his name till it became Shavender. You've heard of the Shavender family out of Pantega. I have not. Well, the Shavenders are, uh, uh, <clears throat> they, you see a lot of trucks on the road. They're purple, the trucks are. That's Uncle Dick's, some of his crowd. They're in the trucking business, and uh, I think he's got, but my grandfather, Sam Shavender, owned Terracilla. Oh, yeah. You've heard the, of Terracilla? Yeah, I sure have. That was where my grandmother was born. That was his farm, Terracilla. Oh, my goodness. That was, a, <clears throat> at, that, at one time, that was the largest farm east of the Mississippi River. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it never was. I mean, even when my father was a little boy, he would go there, of course, go back where his family come from. They were farming them with horses, you know. And he had 40 teams of Persian horses that, Uncle, that one, Uncle Pat was farming it. Then those are huge them. horses, aren't they? Yeah, those are them draft horses. Mm-hmm. That's what they're mm-hmm. <clears throat> In fact, I heard grand, grandmother, her, her father bought the first tractor in his state. He went to the Chicago Exposition in 1893 and bought a tractor. Of course, he was always buying something. Bought a tractor. He thought it was going to revolutionize farming, but it was built for the plains. It was steam, you know. Of course, put it over on that black land, the damn thing sunk out there. <laughs> I had to pull it out with the horses. That was before they had rubber tires. Rubber tires. They had cleated tires when yeah. it sunk right on down. Her grandma was talking about Paul. That's what she called Paul. She said, Paul would 
always bawling, saying, bring it home, you know. But but he was ahead of his time. Well, he, he realized that that was... The tractor know, had fossil, called up to him, fossil fuel, his thinking. That's that. right. Fossil fuel was going to be the thing of the future. And, of course, horses eventually phased out, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mules, they couldn't use mules because their feet were so small. They'd sink down oh. through their knees on that black land. I didn't realize that. Yeah, they had to put oversized shoes, and of course that created a problem. But in big old draft horses, their feet was this big, you know, they sort of used to break, like, break the land with. Kind of like camels walking that's in right, the sand, you know, right. they got same same big, same big same feet. feet. They're adapted to that kind of environment. Wonderful. Oh, gosh, I learned, I always learned the most talking to you, Jay. No, you don't <laughs> this I do. You that do I do. That. <laughs> but anyway, that was the background. Of course, we, my grandfather, came in this county in 1904 and bought Prime's Island and uh, he heard he was oystering during the oyster bonanza during in the when he and grandmother were married in 95 and of course sometime in the late 90s or mid 90s that's 1895 that's right, right. they uh Pamco Sound was nothing but a big oyster rock right big oyster bed but most of the oysters were being taken back to Virginia. They were sending boats from Virginia and Maryland down here. But still there was some shucking going on. In fact, the Regan's family moved to Marshallburg from out of Crisfield, Maryland, and they had a shucking house. And then Bell Haven was built. That's what built Bell Haven along mm -hmm. with lumber was, was Roper Lumber Company and the oyster bee industry. Wow. That's had, when the oyster wars started. That's right. It? Well, see, the Marylanders come down here in Virginia, and they tried to Run North Carolina off the ground, you know, and that didn't work too good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> but then, back then they were using sharpies and and battoes, and Granddaddy bought a batto in in Virginia, and and that's what he was doing. And he found out about this island that was vacant. See, we had a every governor comes along in this state is an education governor, just about. You know, we've had a number of them in my lifetime. Well, they had an education governor in the late 90s, in uh, ACOC. And so he got, he passed a compulsory school rule, had it passed through the legislature. So prior to that time, you didn't have to send your children to school unless you wanted to. Of course, you had to pay. Most of the time it was private schools and you had to pay, you know. But uh, they, of course, public schools came along, they had a compulsory school rule. Well, there were six families living on Brian's Island. <clears throat> and of course, there was a number of families living all over the eastern part of the county. But there weren't enough children there for they had to carry them off to the mainland. And most of the families went to Moorhead. They were Nelsons. And that's what built, that's what most of you are like. Well, uh, we Roy Hamilton, he married a Nelson girl that was raised on Brian's Island. Hubert Fulcher's mother used to be Police chief in Maury, his yeah. mother was raised on Brian's Island. Gosh. And so any number like John Nelson used to be principal of these mm -hmm. his family came by. They all went oh, to okay. Maury. But So the, so what other names were all on the island on Brown's uh, Island? All Nelsons. All Nelsons? At that time in the more oh. Nelsons had the the island was first owned by by uh, 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 Zachariah Harker. And the Harker family had either sold out or married into the Nelson family. But Nelson is an old Carter County yeah, name, you know. Yeah. And uh, so Granddad found out it was nobody living there. He started buying up the rights. It took him 16 years to get it under one deed. Oh wow! So he, he was persistent, <clears throat> wasn't he? Well, he just as he he was in he had been in the, he had been in the army. He went in the army in 1891. And that was, uh, he was, there was one other Southern boy that was in same, the same, the outfit he was, that was First Coast Artillery Battery B. And he was a fellow in Pamco County. Well, in 1913, so he moved here in 1904, they bought, they bought a ride out, and it was the old, it was the old, uh, Matthew Gooding home place. You've heard of Matthew Good. Mm -hmm, I have. Well, that's where he was. He admired Melissa Harker. That was a Harker family, see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, that, and that's where my father was born there in 1909 on Brian's Island. But 
1913, Granddad was in the meat business. He was supplying meat to most all your groceries in over City Grocery, C.D. Jones. <clears throat> I think you but, saw the Freemans. Uh, Miss Charlie Freeman, Miss mm-hmm. Sam Harker, Moorhead. They were in the meat business. Mm-hmm. And Mr. R.T. Willis, he built, when he built his store right, he built a shed on his hut. Granddad sold meat. Look, sanitation wasn't a thing. It was outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't, you know. Still, you took your chances. <laughs> well, that's right. But anyway. Uh, did he salt his meat? <clears throat> well, pork he did, it? but beef, he sold it. Killed it and sold it because there was no refrigeration. I had to yeah. sell it quick. But, uh. So he went down to the Army, went down there to uh, <clears throat> Camp Glenn, and that's where the 1st North Carolina Cavalry was bivouacked. This was about 1913. They were getting ready for, that was before we got in the war, but the states, see, the, in the First World War, the states supplied, the, it was militias, I guess, and they converted them over into the regular army. So that, they went to war like that. They didn't mix, they weren't mixed up. And, uh, but the guy that was in charge of the commissary was this fellow Pittman that he had served with up in Virginia, Fort Monroe, Virginia. So he got the contract supplied in 20,000 men. Wow. So he went over, by the way, out of the end of cattle everywhere. Woods was full of cattle, the beach was full of cattle. But he went over to Ms. Hoffman on Bug Banks and made a deal with her. Bug Banks was full of cattle and angora goats and whatever. And he bought them on the hoof and butchered them and sold them by the carcass, not by weight. Wow. And I think he was paying four dollars a head and selling them for ten. That's pretty good. He's a good businessman. <laughs> Anytime you spend four dollars and make six, well you're doing all right. <laughs> we he need knows to... it was a whole lot less than what we think now. Well, still the rate of exchange was the same and the buying power was oh, yeah. much greater. Yeah, you could buy I mean, I've heard him talk about buying Gun shells was twenty five dollars a box. I mean twenty five cent a, a box. box. Twenty five cent, and you could buy a single barrel gun for two dollars. <laughs> you, know, you know, but anyway, unheard I, you know, of today. That's a unheard of thing. But that's the way we got. He got his county. He eventually paid it off, I guess, or he made the money to buy the other bought rights out, and uh, <clears throat> wound up with. We live, we live in Marshallburg now. We started off living in Gloucester. Um, that's where I live now, in Gloucester. Now, on Browns Island, um, I remember reading uh, when you were talking with Bland Simpson about a fort. Over right. There. Well, during the Civil War, they had a fort. It faced, they had two guns. One gun faced towards Corsair, the other gun faced out towards the Straits. Now, I bought, I bought a, 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 a topo it was map on the here. very, very, can, can, very end can, right here. Just kind of mark it X. Well, it started. Let's see, high ground is. It, it started, I'll say, about right along here. That was okay. right there. And what they'd done, they went in here and dug a ditch. And I remember as a boy playing in that ditch, because it's all eroded out now mm-hmm. in the sand. But uh, they had a. Let's see, I'm a little bit too far to the, to the southern. It was like this, is the way it was down here on this end. And they had it like that. And they had a gun over here, and then they had a gun right here. He could shoot across here, and then had one that shot across here. Oh, I see. So there was an old woman, said, all this part of most of down east were buffaloes. You know what a buffalo Yeah, was? yeah, you know, the ups, uh, well, uh, union were, sympathizers. They were used because they had no slaves and they had no, no dog in the fight, you know, so. There was this old woman over here, and they in Marshallburg. Yeah, that Polly's Hill. Nobody lived on. They'd put a target up, and they'd target practice. And they didn't have but three or four cannonballs. They'd shoot them over there, and they'd send soldiers <laughs> over there to get them. You know, bring them back, and shoot them again. <laughs> that is <laughs> great. Huh? That is great. But this old, I've heard my grandfather tell his yards. I don't know, but this old woman, she was well. Anyway, she one of the cannonballs. They shot it over there, and he. They overshot the target, and he went up in her yard, and she towed it in the well. Well, they went over looking for it, and they trailed it where he hit and plowed a trench, you know, no cannonball. So they went back and told this fellow. The fellow was in charge of this fort. There was a fellow named Benjamin Leecraft. 
Oh, in Lee Craft Craft House. Right there, right there in, in Beaufort. In on, on the street there in Beaufort, in Lee Craft yeah. place. Right. He was in charge. had 24 men. That's what he had in charge. That's what he was there. So they went back. So he went over there, I guess, or he sent maybe his underling or somebody. And this little boy was there. And, of course, they struck up a call and asked that little boy, said, you haven't seen that cannibal, have you? And he said, yes, and granny threw it in the well. So they lowered somebody down in the well and got the cannibal. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now, was there a name for the for this little fort? I don't think so. I don't believe there was. Uh, if it was, I don't know. I've never heard anybody say it was. But that, but they they camped a, a soldier's well. I had a well dug right back up here. And we used. I used to go with my father when I was a boy. In August, we always had a dry spell, and that's for uh, Granddaddy put an artesian well over there when sometime, I guess, right about the end of the Second World War. When I was a little boy, I'd go out with him and beat mosquitoes. He'd have to dig that well out. Oh, keep, so the cattle would have somewhere, it had a spring, it'd fill up, it was a pond maybe, I don't know, say I'm eight feet across, it would, but it had to get down in there, and it, what the soldiers had done, they had they put barrels. Like they dug this thing out and staved it in with, with oak. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while he'd find he'd come across one of them staves, you know. Oh, wow. And he'd say, of course, this was 100 years later. They're about 100 years, 90 years later. But okay. but if it was in that mud, that, they could have stayed. stayed good, and, yeah. yeah, it could. And I heard him, tell, heard him say, that he'd tell, he'd say, well, them soldiers put it here. And uh, they had a, the camp where they... I, I let somebody, Esther owns that piece of property now, her family does. Joanne, Violent Joanne Brooks owns that end of the island. So uh, way back, I think it was sometime in the 60s, somebody come over with a metal detector was trying to find, you know, artifacts and stuff. I don't know what they find. I wasn't interested in <clears throat> about what was going on. But since then, I missed a lot of things by not making notes and not, my father and my grandfather, they they knew, you know, the ins and outs of all these things. And that's the reason that a lot of this stuff is going by the boards, you know. Oh, I understand. Come. I understand. I'm the same way. Yeah, that's right. Listen, the, uh, I have read some accounts of some kind of camp or fort on Harker's Island, but I have never seen it. But would this have been considered well, that in all, time, maybe this part all, of This was all training island. All, All this Cranium. Cranium Island. Mm -hmm. The whole works was Craney Island. And then it became Parker's Island after, after the, my granddaddy bought this in 1906. I think I've heard him say many times there were only about six people living on Parker's Island. Mm -hmm. See, after the storm over here, after the, well, the Weiss's people off of, off of, I used to talk to Mr. Ambrose Lee Guthrie. Mr. Ambrose Lee lived to be a hundred. He was one of the last people. They moved off of Shaver's Banks. He moved to Marshallburg. Him, Mr. Lambert, Mr. Janey, and Mr. John Stone, and Mr. Walter Stone. And there were one more. There were six families moved to Marshallburg. And, uh, but Mr. Walter and Mr. John wound up in Warhead with their people in their old age. They moved down there. Uh, this James Willis, you know what I'm talking about? He lives over Atlantic Beach. Yes, sir. Jim? Yes. Well, he was Captain Jim. Jim. <laughs> Captain Jim. He, yeah, he'll recollect you if you got to tell him. <laughs> but he was, uh, his family was, through his mother, I think, was those Starnes, Mr. Walter Starnes. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Amherst Lee, I would talk to him down Sundays and sit and talk with him. And he he was had a very vivid memory of all up until the very end. And he contended that it wasn't a storm that ran them off. Well, a storm was the cause of it, but they'd cut the trees down and let the sand come through, cleaned up you know, vegetation. And, of course, when the storm did come, well, he said the sand was to the winter sills in his house when he left there. Mm. I, I have seen, uh, there's a, a geographer named Collier Cobb, and he talked about wellheads of sand. Right, Going and uh, there's actually a picture of a <clears throat> of a cottage on um, Shackerford that's almost inundated Covered, by the yes, sand. Right. That's why old man Amber Lee was talking to me. And he said, of course, he killed the trees. What after the sand got to move him, well, he, he smothered the trees out what was left, and and people just had to leave. 
Well, most of the people that left, some of them went going down the beach, solar path, some of them went to, some went to Beaufort, some went to Moorhead, that was the promised land. Mm -hmm. but Corey here the other day, I was talking to her, and, and, and just like this, and Corey asked me, she said, Julia, so I, well, she's into education, but right. day, she said, why is it that there weren't a school at Moorhead? I said, well, Corey, now stop and think. One man owned all of that, or two families, or three families. They didn't have enough children out of school. I said, Moorhead never was a city until the Promised Landers moved there. Mm -hmm. He said, when I go up, you call somebody a Promised Lander, you better be ready to fight. That's now right. they run to you and hug you. Yeah, that's right. Go <laughs> down Shepherd, Shepherd Street, that's Shepherd right. Street, all down that lower part of Emmy Street, you know. They, they moved Moorhead. Well, when those son went to Swansboro. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't realize that. See, Dr. Moore, Mr. Tari. Yeah, Mr. Abram, Moore, uh -huh. Mr. Abram, Mr. Tarry went to Marshallburg. Mr. Hedrick, he moved over here. Then he had a, another brother that went to Swansboro. This is Alec Moore's granddaddy. Oh. They, moved, they all started right there, what we call down at the Mullet Point. That's down the western end of Shackford Banks. Right there? Or is that, or is that? I reckon, let's see. Uh, I don't, I reckon it is. Anyway, they started on sacred things. <clears throat> but, but they, Mr. Ambrose Lee told me a yarn one time about, he was, he had a little store that faced the ocean between two hills. And that was, and he, he was, uh, he, he, him, they were just like, it was in the spring of the year. And so he had a brother named Albert O'Brady. Mm. Albert O'Brady Guthrie. That was his name. That's a great name. And, you know, and, they were sitting talking just like most people do when they didn't have a whole lot to do. And this this brother of his was sitting on a nail keg and he had a little dog. He scratched him and said dog was sitting between his legs, scratched him, but it one just scratched him, you know, talking, everybody was talking and he said there was a cloud made up over in the southwest. And he said directly a streak of lightning come out and hit him, kill him. Well, I told Sonny Williams this same yarn. I'd been a long time since I'd even thought about it, but Mr. Ambrose Lee, I heard him tell it two, three times. And, uh, now this was to Shackerford. That's Shackerford Bank. Mm -hmm. That was sometime before the storm in 98 or 99, whenever mm -hmm. that, this was uh, probably early 90s, late 80s, something like And so Sonny did a lot of research and found uh, Albert O'Brady Guthrie, found in his death, I mean, it was recorded that he had died you know, just like I told Dennis, you know Dennis Chadwick, yeah, yeah. Sonny, about uh, Matthew Goody. Well, Dennis thought I was just making this stuff. See, Dennis's people come from Browns Island. Mm -hmm. Dennis's mother was an Elson. <clears throat> and so um, she was a Mur Murphy, but her mother was an Elson. But anyway, uh, so one day he he got to looking, come to find out all this stuff I told him about Matthew Goody. And I heard my grandfather tell the you know, many times was always interesting. He was he was the blockade runner, the first one. You see, when they captured when they captured the fort in Charleston, they captured the Confederates captured the newest gunboat that the, that the Federals had they built two of them, the Nashville and the Keystone State. Mm -hmm. They captured the Nashville. So they brought her down here to Moorhead. Put her under the fort. See, they'd already captured the Confederates, had this fort, and it was easier. They, they, what they were afraid of, Charleston the Harbor was so big, they couldn't protect her, you know, because the Federals come in and take her back. So they brought her down in here. Well, Matthew Gooding was, he was on a ship, on a vessel that was anchored in here. We were working with the Trondheim Company out of Charleston. He was captain of that vessel. Her name was a Gonder. Gonder. The name was a Gonder. Well, they did the Confederacy didn't have a navy, so they sold this vessel to a consortium. I guess probably the Tron Langer must have been part of it because he took the instruments off the Gonder navigation instruments and he went out as pilot and carried her to Georgetown. And uh, they changed her name. Every time she went to sea and come back, they changed her name <laughs> to confuse, you know. But she was the newest gunboat. They they had, and she was a side wheeler. 
And uh, they, the first time they changed her name, they changed her to the WG WAG, W A G G. Okay. And then when she was sunk in Savannah, her name was a rattlesnake. So they changed it numerous times. And Dennis, he he had did a lot of research and got a lot of information about that because, see, the crew on her, after Matthew Goodin went on her, her crew was all Town Easters. Carter County mm-hmm. mostly, you know, because the crowd that had sailed with him, he just switched over and went and went to, you know, took him on her. And then what he was, he got 5% of the gross. It went, every time he went out, he either went to Bermuda or Nassau. And of course, his money went in, it was really sterling. But when he come back, his money was Confederate, which wound up being no good. So his, his wife, Melissa, after the war, he, uh, she got her money, most of her money it was in the other banks, but of course the money. As a, his first voyage, he bought the, he bought the first guns and the first powder and the first shot for the Confederate Army. This is Matthew? This is Matthew Good. Okay. So you go, you can trace that right back. Wow. Island. Wow. Huh? It's incredible. See, he bought, Sonny's got all that information and and it'd be interesting you know somebody like you that would carry it on into oh, posterity that would know what to do with it wow. but he's got that because i kept you know kept talking to him and after he got in it he found one of the tonheim families living in california oh. he called he had corresponded with him and talked to him and they gave him a lot of the a lot of the history of the company that was a that was a large sailing consortium that, that uh, were in Mercantile business out of Charleston. Golly. See, Charleston was uh, that was the area that this part of the world traded with. They, because you had a fire wind in the summertime, most I mean in the uh, in the winter time going going south. And after you got down there in the summertime, you had to beat your way down there in a the sailboat. But you could always come back with a sidewester, you know. <laughs> so, Smart. Like, yeah. You know, but Smart. then you didn't have to go out around Diamond Shoals, mm-hmm. right around Cape Lookout Shoals, and then go around Diamond Shoals, go north. That started later on. Mm-hmm. But early on, Charleston was the place to go. Port of call, you know. And they went down to Jamaica. And right. All well, those Matthew Gooding died. He was in Savannah when he died. And of course, Savannah, if it built out on a peninsula, you got the Geechee River on one side. And the Savannah River on the other, <clears throat> and I had his original wheel. I say I had it. It was in my trunk. It, my grandfather, when he bought Brian's Island, had bought a lot of, a lot of the original stuff. Would come along with it, you know. People, that was a, back in those days. That's what when you bought a piece of property, all the back deeds went with it, and the mm-hmm. wheels and stuff. But he he started out. I Matthew W. Good, and he was 32 years old when he caught. Evidently had yellow fever or had some kind of disease, you know. That he knew he was in bad shape. He said, I, Matthew W. Gooding, and of sound mind and failing body, standing on the banks of the Geechee River under the limbs of a dead live oak tree, a thinking and a pondering. That's the way he started his wheel. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. Thinking and a pondering. A thinking and a pondering. And his first mate. His mate was A.S. Chadwick. That was Jimmy, and that was Aubrey Chadwick's great grandfather. He signed his will. He was a witness to his will. Mm. <clears throat> and, uh, he was a wealthy man by anybody's standards at that time. He owned property in Oakley, he owned property on Brian's Island. He had property in Kinston. He had assets in numerous banks. I mean, uh, he he got five percent of the. His father, Jonathan Gooding, he was crewman on the Snapdragon under Matt under under the under Otway Burns. Under Otway Burns, he had, see they had a system that was not a thing in the world, but a, she was a privateer. But that was just legalized piracy, is what right. everybody did. Right, you get a it's called a letter of marquee is what you sail under, and uh, and of course some people nations that didn't have navies. That's the way they level the playing ground. They you know, give, and that means you could, you weren't supposed to take any of the, any of the, the combatants that were friendly, but you could put on, but they took everybody. 
And they laid off here, and whoever come by, they, they took him, bought the cargo, shore and sold it. I don't think they killed the crew, they turned them loose, you know. But, sure. but uh, it's Jonathan Good, and he had bought a full shire. That means that he wasn't a, he wasn't a hard crewman. He was, he shired into the, into the, and Sonny had got all that information about what her voyage is. And of course, she, she unloaded her bumper. And he had a record. He went to the archives and Raleigh got the records. You know, about, in, in the first voyage that Otway Burns from the Snapdragon was a hundred, over a hundred thousand dollars. See, that means that the crewmen all got a hefty sum of yes, money. Yes, they did. So I guess probably Matthew heard his father talking about it when he got a chance to be a privateer, well, he, he, he jumped at it. He, well, I don't blame him. No, I don't either. <laughs> don't blame him a bit. Yeah, I don't want to be it. Well, <clears throat> uh, let me ask you, um, now, when you were, you grew up in Marshallburg. Yeah, I grew up in Marshallburg, and I went to school in Smyrna, and, and, uh, <clears throat> but I spent most of my summers in Hattress. Uh-huh. I'd always go after school. So my mother would go down, and we'd spend anywhere, sometimes six weeks, sometimes two months, or at least always a month. Mm-hmm go back home, you know. And that was in, in Hatteras then had no road. The road was built around forty seven. And so they uh, we uh, the poor freight boats if you had to get a piece of meat to eat on Sunday, you had to send to live city or little Weissen to get it. How about that? <laughs> there were no refrigeration. <laughs> uh, That's amazing. Well it, it was a good place to grow up really. Uh, a wonderful place. Well, Marshallburg was a good place. Of course, we went to town in the boat, just like everybody on Saturdays. Everybody at Harvey's Island went to Beaufort. On Saturdays? On Saturdays. And, of course, we'd go about twice a month. Daddy would, but then, as a boy growing up, they run a bus in. They run a bus all the way to Atlantic. Right. And, of course, the mail went on the bus. And, of course, the old Lita was... Uh, <clears throat> That was Mr. Mr. Elmo Fulcher. He was from Harpers Island, but he married Oak Coat. Mm-hmm. He was in Mr. Mr. George O'Neill. They owned the Elite at that time. And Ellen were, Fulcher Clouds. Asteroid right, Daddy, uh, Mr. Elmo. Yeah. He was Manus and Matthew's brother, and there was some Panny, Panny Davis's mother was his sister. And mm-hmm. of course, he had another sister married Frank Pake, just died the other day in mm-hmm. You know, they were all local people. Mm-hmm. So they did, but when we'd go on the mailboat, Elmo would let me ride down in Fort Peak with him and Mr. George. Oh, that's <laughs> great. You know. Now, on the Alita, was there, did, did people play cards on the back of her? It seems like I've seen this picture. Not well, they might have. They were all kinds. They had, a, they had, a, had a benches up top, and she was decked all over. She had a house all over, and then when the weather was back, of course, you sit inside. Mother always sitting inside because she got seasick. <laughs> but, I, but Elmo, he let me, he always, he and Daddy were a good friend. He always took me in charge of her. And, I, and that's where, talking about Henry, he, Henry would be... Henry Piggy. Henry Piggy. From he was, yeah. well, I can remember when, they, when the mailboat stopped Cedar Island with the mail. You know, mm-hmm. There'd be somebody out there in a skiff. They'd run up in Cedar Island Bay. And of course, he'd pass on the mail bag and they'd throw give him one on, the, and then she'd go right on down through the Wainwrights and on through the little channel, we call it, Cross Rock, go on there to Henry to <clears throat> Portsmouth. And uh, he'd be out there waiting. He'd pull out there and be, have that oar stuck down with his arms down there waiting for they'd go out to him. And, and that's where they changed the mail in. And, of course, then we'd go, we'd get, you'd get to Oakley Cove the evening about 5 o'clock. And everybody in the neighborhood would meet the mailboat. See the old folks and children, everybody be there to the dock or to Little Ike store. That's a country. Little Ike's, yeah. That was Little Ike. That was a country grocery there, you know, or the community grocery it is. That was Lucille. That was his daughter running that, and she married James Garish. Oh, the other Garish. Yeah, all that. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, now, were you saying that when the buses started taking the mail down east, that that kind of put the... The uh, mailboats out of the No, the mail, they, for, they, well, they carried the mail for years after the bus carried that mail down east. And see, the bus would carry the mail down there, and of course, they picked up all the way back, you know. We rode the town a lot of times on the bus, walk out to the corner, and 
there was a shirt factory bus that run through and picked up women for the shirt factory. No kidding. Oh, yes. And you get on that shirt factory bus and go to town. And that evening, you come back after the shirt factory at 4 o'clock or so. You but, come on back about home. When, about when was that? Well, this was sometime in the late 40s. 40s, yeah. Before <coughs> before World War II? Before, after World War II. After World War II. After World War II. Right, after World War II. And that, that was the Jackson family? That was, was ja Miss Jackson. Miss Jackson. Family. Yeah. How about that? Send a bus out to pick up people. I had never heard that. That's yeah, that's sure. About this fella, fella Guthrie drove the bus near an Arkansas. <laughs> uh, I'll be dog. That is <laughs> that is great. Yeah, there is. Now, when uh, they built the the uh, bridge here to Harper's Island in 1941. Uh, that was, I don't recollect that. My old memory was there was a bridge across there. Okay. So I was born in 37, so I yeah, was yeah, little, you're a little we were living at or something. Yeah. Well, I had heard some, uh, and maybe your father had talked about, there was some strange things happening with the ferry that used to go back Well, Mr. Ob, Mr. Ob Chadwick run the ferry. How do you spell Ob? His name was Oliver. And that, oh. was his, that was his nickname was Mr. Ob. His name was Oliver Chadwick. Oliver Chadwick, but Ob. Mr. Ob, O-B-B. Yeah. -B. Ob, <laughs> O-B. That was, uh, he ran the ferry. Yeah, they were, I don't know. But, uh, they he left from our ferry dock in Gloucester and come, well, they had a dock there in West Bay. Mm -hmm. That was the ferry there where James Gillikin lived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were, <clears throat> but that was the ferry dock. When, when talking about going, when I was a boy, Sundays, of course, there weren't much to be. We, Daddy and Ivy Gaskell were real good friends. Mr. Ivy lived back up the road going on west here. And uh, we, Salski, then, and that was before, well, there weren't no such things. I wore motor and all that stuff back in the 40s. You wanted, if you did see one, why, well, first thing somebody said, she'll leave you somewhere, you have a pole. <laughs> you know? But we had a Salski, and Daddy always had a Salski of our shore. And go Sundays, they, me, me, my mother and daddy would come around after dinner and visit, you know. We'd go out to Mr. Ivy and Mr. Birdie's. Well, they had, Mr. Ivy had a bunch of younger, there's Ivy Miller, you know, not Ivy Miller, but uh, Sandy's husband, or Sandy Gaskell's husband. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I know. talking about mm -hmm. um, Anyway, um, Elbert. 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 Right. Elbert was a baby. Well, they had, a, they had a, two boys. Another, they had Ivy Miller. Ivy, he lived. I think Ivy Miller was still living. He, he married Southport. And then F. Louise was my age. That was, and Annie Brown and Clara, and I don't know, a whole gang of girls. But, uh, <clears throat> of course, that was a big trip then. But, but the, the boats, the fishing boats, would be anchored just as close together. They could hardly swing all the way down the backside just hard. Wow. And that was, I remember there one of them painted just as, wow. just now, right. Now, the back side of the island, is that the straight side? No, no that's that the was, that back sound side. Back sound side. Okay. So that was on the south side of the island. Okay. And that would be anchored all the way down, clear on to, on up by Rush Point. And most people lived on that side of the island, didn't they? And everybody did. They walked up and down the shore, the road, nobody, I mean, you know. Yeah. That was our, the shoreline was where people, that was our having to travel. Karen uh, Aspacker told me about all the net spreads. That's she right. misses the net That's spreads. Well, that was it. everybody had a, every family or every fisherman had a net spread because you had cotton nets. That means you had to pull them out every day and let the sun dry them. Right. It didn't it melt, you know, because you had to wash them with a line. And it was, it was a labor intense. Fishing was very labor. Mm -hmm. I remember when nylon came around. That was the greatest thing. <laughs> there was a fellow, Sam Eaton, I mean, uh, Tom Eaton. The Newburn, he was the one who built the ice plant in Hattress. Mm. Tom Eaton did, and he got in. He was he got into the nylon net business after sometime in in the late forties, early fifties, fifty one or two. And of course, then monofilament came after that, which you just, just changed everything. Well, that's it? right. You don't have to worry about in the you leave my board. You just cover them up, keep the sun off of them. Or right. used to, you had to spread them every day. Mm. Come in there and pull him off the boats and spread them, or you either had to line them real heavy to kill the bacteria and cover them up. You, you know, you know they they'd fall out the lines. I was uh, to Brooks uh, 
uh, you know, people who own the Brook Storage Facility, and they had a yeah, net. That's, that's Joanne and Benjamin. They're, Joanne's my first cousin. They had a net there uh, and some real corks, you know, not oh, the uh, cork synthetic, corks. Yeah, real corks, and and uh, it was still limed down. That's right. It still had lime Still down. lime on sure. It was, if you didn't have a lime, you would they kind of buy, you had a buyer of lime aboard the boat, just like you had in, a, in their cockpit with water, where they could plug it, make it, they'd bail that full of water and mix a bucket of lime in that, stir it, they'd pull that net in that limey water, and that would cut all that slime off of her. I see. And then, of course, they'd stack her ready to sit next day, you know, and cover up with a, have a tarp, something cover up with. Did you fish? Well, my daddy was a fisherman all his life. You know, I fished. That's the way I sent my children to school. Yeah. I went. I went to school. I went to East Carolina. I graduated, and I taught for a number of years. I was stayed in the education business fourteen years, but I was technically in student nine of that. Uh -huh. I was director over there, and I remember what my grandfather told me every day that I worked in the education business. I, 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 1960, I took a job teaching school in Amalford. First job I had. And on Sunday morning, all the men would collect up on the porch and talk about what they did that week, you know. When was they most get ready to go to Sunday school? Some of, some of them would go to church, and Daddy would go to church, but most of the men that I don't know, they, they weren't, they were backsliders. <laughs> but anyway, I remember I got there, I was talking to Helen Grandy, I said, I signed a contract. Of course, I was, you know, he didn't say anything. And that's why I noticed that he, Still didn't say anything. So finally I said, Granddad, you don't act like you're too happy with my decision. He said, well, son, he said, you don't think much of your life when you start sounding off by the hour. Wow. I wow. never forgot that. Wow. That is profound. <laughs> that is profound. He told me that. And every morning when I got up, I remember that. Wow. Especially after I got over more he had and they're fighting this guy trying to get to school, you know. Mm -hmm. Your Uncle John worked there with Yes, he did. John worked there, and I thought, well, I don't know. John Williams. <clears throat> John Williams, yeah. Of course, Joe, I knew all your family. Yeah. But uh, they, uh, I thought about every morning going to work, I'd have it cross my mind. I said, so one morning, I got up, and I'd made all my plans, but I hadn't told my wife. And I sitting on the side of the bed, she said, what's wrong? I said, well, I don't know how to tell you, but, I guess I just won't blurt it out. I'm going to resign this morning. It was the first day of May in uh, 1974. She said, you're going to do what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I've got my letter of resignation written. She said, what in the world are we going to do? She said, we owe, of course, I like everybody else on salary. I owe whatever I knew I was going to get. And I said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, but... I'm not going to do this no more. I said, because I just had enough. I've had all of them. I'm just not going to do it anymore. I said, whatever we can't pay for, I'll just have to come get so I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I quit. Oh I gave them 30 days notice and quit. And I started me a boat. I hadn't, I was right after I quit, started me a boat. I went to work. And I had, I had started this little old business down the beach, you know, before, but. It wasn't much, but I, I saw the potential there that you could build it into something where you can make a living out of it, at least for part of the year anyway. And I got me a boat, and of course there was plenty of stuff to catch. And the guys that were in the water then, clamming and oystering, I mean, uh, scalloping, and sinking nets were making big money. I mean, compared to even nine of big money. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm glad I did now. Or at least I got some enjoyment out of it. I'm too old to do anything That's now. Right. <laughs> I think I joined it for <laughs> 40 years anyway. And was it, was it, you really think it was your, what your granddad Well, yeah, I, I think that it was just probably he planted a seed there that yeah. finally grew up to, to be a bigger tree than I could get around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have planted one in me, I don't <laughs> I, uh, know, right now. But that was, uh, That's amazing. But I remember what he said, he said, I'm 90, he was 90 years old then, and he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, I've never seen anybody had enough money to buy any of my time. Wow. And my daddy was that way. You couldn't hard daddy. Like he said, he said, ain't nobody got enough money to harm me if I got to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. 
Well, that must be where my whole family gets yeah, that attitude. Right. Right. Well, they were raised free. Yeah. You know, freedom is something that very few people have ever known. Oh, that, that's true. Very few people have ever known it. And we get anathesized to the fact that you've got to be somewhere at a certain time because somebody tells you that you've got to be there. Well, if you've ever been free, that kind of chafes, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Chafes bad. Mm -hmm. Would you indulge me with, uh, if you can uh, remember the story of, of the guy from Stacy that lost his hat on the dock? Do you remember that? You were telling me on the. Um, uh, oh, that was, from sea, that was that was from sea level. Sea level. Okay. That, that was a. Uh, uh, it was Taylor. It was old man Tony Taylor. Yeah. His name was Valentine Taylor. They call him Tony Taylor. He ran a store. <clears throat> My uncle. When they first built it, Walter Nelson built the Alita mm -hmm. out of it from Atlantic. He built her with, a, with he was going to bid on the mail contract from Moorhead to, I reckon she ran through the Oak Cup, I don't know. But old man Tom Hamilton had had the mail contract from Atlantic to Moorhead for years and years. The boat was named the Hero. And he ran... Through the sign, you can never about set your clock on him, you know, run through the sign. Well, when Walter, remember Walter, I believe, Walter Nelson. Anyway, he was a Nelson. I, I can't remember whether it was Walter or Walter. I believe it was Walter Nelson. But anyway, <clears throat> Uncle Roy, Daddy's oldest brother, he hired him to run the boat for him. Mr. Mr. Nelson did. And uh, so anyway, Mr. This, this Mr. Tony Taylor, he, he had a store there right in Nelson Bay, him and Alvy Taylor. Mm -hmm. And Alvy, well, do you know Louetta? I probably, well, probably that's Louetta's right. retired. Louetta's my age. She went through the nursing program, and uh, she went to work with, I don't know if they weren't, some train outfit with her. I believe it was, I can't remember now what her, but she stayed going all her life and after she retired. She came back to sea level. But anyway, there were some of that same family, family of Taylors, you know, that, you know, I don't think Mr. Mulvey was, uh, he was probably some of them, but I don't think he was brother to any Mr. Uh, Mr. Tony. Mr. Mr. Jim Wallace Taylor was Mr. Valentine Taylor's son. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I, that's okay. what I was trying to give you a background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but anyway, he would come down the dock halfway and, and bring his mail bag. It was in the post office store, and, and of course, pick take the mail bag and Roy would meet him, go back and get aboard the boat, and of course he go on to Atlantic and go on right on up. I think he went clear to Port clear to the Oak Coat, and then he come back the next day. But anyway, he he had a, these little old straw hats called porcupines. They were them little straw hat, shallow brim hats. And it, it was a rack of them there, and before he went out, he'd always put one of them on his head, old man Tony would. Well, <clears throat> he, we were blowing Southwest, solid screaming gale, March Southwest. He, he come out of that store, and he took two, three steps, and he blew that hat off, and he went over there in the marsh, and he stepped back and got him another one, had his hand on it, somebody hollered at him and said, Tony, where are you going? He turned around, took his hand off of it, and he blew that one over. He, he, looked, he looked right straight up and said, but damned if I don't one time want to get southwest of a southwest. <laughs> he wanted to go somewhere far enough away. Southwest of Thank a southwest. Was that, that the yarn you were That was about? the one. That was the one. Thank yeah, you so much for, for saying know, that. Marty. I've heard Uncle Roy tell that a hundred times. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that is so great. That is so great. And, and my father had told me that story. Same story. Same went story. All over down yeah, everybody. Long loved stories. It. That, I used to go, when I was a boy, uh, Mr. Josh Hardy from South River would come spend a week with Granddaddy. Mr. Mulby and Mr. Mr. Uh, Francis Murphy and, and uh, uh, old man Goodman there to see Ryland, I can't think of his name now, he was Red and he was Granddaddy. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Lawrence Hassel, Every one of they come, of course, them days people talked. They didn't have television, they didn't have, you know, that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> people talked, and uh, they, they were there, old people were there. I'd, grandma, I'd, of course, I'd stay there about as much as I did at home. But as long as you could stay in the room and listen, 
if you didn't clear your throat or you didn't make no noise, if you did it on your own. That's you right. Know, That's going, right. And if, no distractions. But they tell him yarn one. Everybody had something to tell about, you know, somebody that was notorious in their in their orbit. Oh man, John Jones up there in Cedar Point on an eight sided house. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Granddaddy was great pals. And I used to take Granddaddy up there, well, go with Granddaddy up there, old man John's. And uh, that's little John. I call him little John. He's older than I am, but that's his daddy. And of course, Mr. Josh Hardy, our South River, that was, they, they were uh, always funny, just as funny, had some kind of funny yarn to tell. Like, Harry, do you, you, I think Harry's mine still, but Harry Hardy, South River, that's his, uh, Mr. Joyce, if you get a chance, you need to talk to him, Harry's old man, but last time I talked to Harry, he was just as, he was just as alert as he could be. And uh, would he be in the phone book? Too? Oh yeah, Harry's in the phone book. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah, I, I mean, he would give you some good information. Good. <clears throat> but uh, those people would go, and then Granddaddy, he would leave sometimes. Bessie, if Aunt Maggie, if Aunt Maggie if I'm on my sister, if she come to visit, he left. Of course, they didn't get along for some oh, reason, I don't okay. know why. But Grandma would say to me, I was after I got a driver's license. Well, I, I drove for two or three years and had a driver's license, but after I had an automobile, she said, go see if you can find you can see where your granddaddy went to. Well, I go up there to Mr. Louis Smith. I was on the corner out of Smyrna. I go to Mr. Lewis and Mr. Lewis, I said, Monday, did the granddaddy come here? Yeah, come here, spent most of the day. He said, he eat dinner with me that day. I said, well, which way did he go? And he left here. I said, he went east. Uh, and then I went right straight to Mr. Uh, Mr. Francis Murphy's. I go in there, Miss, <coughs> Miss Missouri, and so I go out and knock on the door, say, let me come on in. I said, no, no, I'm looking for granddaddy. Oh, we spent a night here, Monday night. Him and Francis talked all day. Tuesday evening, he went out. I knew I'd go right on straight to the Atlantic out of, out of Mr. Wallace Storms. And Mr. Wallace would say, stay there soon here. This will be about Friday or Saturday now. He'd be gone all week. And, and he say, yeah, he spent some time here. And so I'd ask Ryan, go out there to Cecil store, see if he'd been there. And he had. Most time he'd been out of Winston's. Well, where did he go? Which way did he go? I knew where he was. He was down at old man Wallace Goodman's. I mean, I don't know. Oh, Wallace Goodman. What was his name? <clears throat> he lived just before you get to the ferry on the right. He owned all that land that Clayton bought where he built that yeah. ferry and all that stuff. Yeah. I'll think of his name in a minute. But anyway, I go, I asked him usually where he'd be. He'd be there. Of course, he hadn't got his, hadn't told all the stories. I'd be half the day getting him away from there most of the time. Come on, let's go. Well, I'll be in just a minute. Got so Brad, I'd get him in the car and we'd head on back home. But if he went that direction, I'd go up there to Martin's Corner. That was our East Carter, oh. and go in there and ask my old man Dewey Martin. I'd Mr. Dewey is, yeah, he stayed here. I said, which way did he go? He left here. He went. He went side river. I knew he was down old man Josh Hardy's, or Miss Charlie Pittman's one, and uh, or if he went Beaufort, he'd go be out of Miss Lawrence Tassel. Or we went to Moorhead's or old man R. T. Willis's. It's not you know, I'd go Tracy you down and follow him right on. I knew where You should have been a detective. Yeah, you know, I knew where he was going. <laughs> but one time I went with him to Miss Charlie Pittman's, I remember I was grown. And uh, that was Charlie Pittman that, that was captain of the of the shad boats I married Miss Polly uh our marshallary. As little Charlie, you know, the one that was flying, he, he was pilot for... For Dewey Willis, Captain Dewey Willis? Well, he was pilot for, yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, he was a, he was a, he lives down with his daughter in Alabama now, little Charlie does. But anyway, there, his daddy, or his granddaddy lives side river. Mm -hmm. But his grandmother comes from Hog Island. From Hog Island? From Hog Island. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, but... Well, man, Charlie had married her over there when she was a whole honor. And uh, but anyway, one time I went to our granddaddy. I was about, I think I was 15 years old, something like that. On a Saturday, we, somebody, I think some crowd, boy, came to come looking for something. Then they carried him down there. But then, and we got there about dinner time. She had a big pot of white beans cooked, never forget. Mm. They were cooked outdoors in one of them big old orange oh, pots. Oh, yeah. All about something good. And we were eating dinner, and 
of course, she had a large can full of biscuits, about that big, you know, biscuits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd eat three or four of them biscuits. And Granddaddy, he, of course, he had a notorious appetite. And, we, and Miss Charlie said, Brian said, How'd you like them biscuits, man? He said, the everything was the best he ever ate, no matter what it was. <laughs> the best he ever ate. He said, you know, that was the last of my buyer lord. Of course, I perked right up. Me and my, my, my hair popped right up. Last of my buyer lord. And uh, he'd kill a buyer sometime in the spring. And oh. a buyer fattens just like a hog. You know, and he tried that lard out. And that's what the old lady made these biscuits out of. And it was so, good. Uh, oh, yeah, it was good. Last time I bear Lord, I never forgot that. Oh my gosh. I, I'm sorry. I have eaten bear stew before. Yeah. Well, but I've never bear, had bear hard Lord, biscuits. Bear before. Lord biscuits, yeah. Oh my that gosh. Was, that, been a, that would have been a long time ago. You know that uh, the road in between Davis Shore and Williston, and uh, and there's a, a, if you're going toward Davis Shore and there's a, uh, a fire road or something off to the left, <coughs> yeah, it's that's got that's a gate across right. it. Well, well, I was driving down there with my mother the other day, and she looked down there, and she says, that's the road your Uncle Joe went hunting down. Right. And he had a gun, he picked up some bear tracks, you know, and he started following them. And he got this weird feeling, he turned around and looked behind him, and the bear was tracking him. That's <laughs> so I can't go by that, yeah, that road right. now, I think about Uncle Joe yeah, getting followed yeah. by the bear. Yeah, he was a great fella, Joe, my children thought. Both my boys thought he was the greatest thing ever Thank been. You. He was. He was a nice guy. Joe was. They, uh, John was too. For that goes. They both of them were. They were. They were just. I don't know. They were kind of people. No matter what was wrong, they threw to and helped you. Oh yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's that's the way uh, that's right. Williams were. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh, I appreciate you saying that. Um, now we only got a little bit of tape left, but I was just wondering, and we might be going under here pretty soon, but. Um, we could throw another tape in, or we could make another appointment. Well, let's make think? another appointment. Okay. I mean, I don't right. need to bore you. I don't. You ain't boring me one bit. No, you ain't boring me I one single bit. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we'll make another appointment. Sure, then. that's right. We can do it again. And I really appreciate.